Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2012 is a CG animated cartoon series that first aired on Nickelodeon on September 28, 2012 in the United States. This series is notable for its creative take on the franchise, like with episodes that provide deep character arcs, interesting plots, a developing story, but being able to keep the charm of the 1987 cartoon with its sillier moments to break up some tension and show the family bond between the turtles. The cartoon series seems to take a lot of inspiration from the previous two TMNT cartoons because of this, but also has a lot of new ideas to keep it fresh, innovative, and not just a mixture of the two series. It stands out on its own. Without further ado, let's give TMNT 2012 an in-depth series review. Before we go into the individual seasons of 2012, let's discuss its foundations and blueprints to better understand what the whole series is about. Story Before Splinter became the mutant rat he is, he was a human named Hamato Yoshi, and one day, while carrying four turtles he brought from a pet store, ran into trouble with aliens known as Krangs. Yoshi and his turtles were exposed to mutagen during the situation, and they started to transform. Yoshi turns into a mutated rat, and the turtles turn more human-like, being able to talk and standing on two legs. Yoshi now uses the name Splinter, and has trained his turtles ninjutsu, in case they ever get caught out on the surface. The turtles, with their skills, fight off many forms of evil, including the Krang aliens, Shredder and the Foot Clan, and they even go to other worlds and dimensions. It isn't all action and chaos, though. The turtles have a huge lair in the sewers they can use to unwind and free their minds from the tension of the outside world. Speaking of which, the Ninja Turtles are often seen watching different cartoons throughout the seasons. They're all parodies of cartoons from the 70s and 80s, including Star Trek the Animated Series, Voltron, and He-Man just to name a few. They often include metaphors that refer to things that will happen in the episode. Art Style The cartoon uses 3D models and backgrounds for its designs. They're rather quite simple and kind of childish. There's a lot of squares and rectangles with rough looking circles and blemishes on just about everything. There's also some 2D animated sections that usually appear whenever a character tells a flashback story. Sound Department The voice actors are really good at portraying their characters. They are on point with their roles. The sound effects are pretty standard, not anything to write home about, but they do their job. Other Inspirations this cartoon definitely draws a lot from the 87 and 2003 cartoons. The 87 influence can be seen in the turtles' personalities, their colored masks, and the less serious moments that are more for comedic relief. The 2003 show provides inspiration for the more serious episodes that tell a story, incorporate advanced narrative elements, and have things like character development to give the show some depth. Characters that were created specifically for those shows also show up in this show too but they were given new twists to make sure they aren't just copies from the previous material. Freeze, dirtbags! Season 1 sees the Turtles' first venture into the outside world, where they begin their days as heroes. So, just like a lot of shows, there's so much to unpack in Season 1. After all, it pretty much sets up the rest of the series. So let me give a summary of the world the Turtles fight evil in. The Turtles have two main opponents, the Krang and the Foot Clan. The Krang are an evil alien organization that hides among society with their robot suits that are made to look human. They hide among many abandoned buildings and secret lairs, and use their secrecy to try and take over the world with mutagen. The Krang are known to speak in the third person, with every sentence they spew being overly specific. They also use their advanced alien technology to kidnap scientists and fight off intruders. The Foot Clan is a ninja clan ran by the evil Shredder, an old enemy of Splinter. Shredder is obsessed with the fall of Splinter and his turtles, to the point where he would sacrifice many of his foot ninjas and other high-ranking subordinates to take them out. 
It's the turtle's job to make sure neither of these threats get out of hand and spread their evil influence over the world. Next, let me introduce the important characters of Season 1 and pretty much the rest of the series. Leonardo, the leader of the group. Leo is quick on his feet, the most noble, and the protector of his brothers. Leo understands the responsibility of his role. The weight of his burden heavily outweighs his power as a leader, but it's what he must do in order to keep his family and the world safe. He also mustn't forget the honor that comes with being a ninja. Donatello, the brains of the group. Donnie creates some of the most impressive pieces of technology, often out of just ordinary materials. Not even the Krang's alien technology can stop his genius inventions. Don in this series is also shown to be kind of awkward. Notice how in his design he's lanky, missing a tooth, and has an odd shaped head. He's sort of portrayed as a stereotypical geek, which does make sense with his love of inventing. Michelangelo, the fun turtle. Mikey has a lust for life. He always gets a kick out of bashing enemies and going on missions. Of course, his biggest downfall is his often non-serious nature, as he'll underestimate the serious of the situation and underperform. Mikey is still a strong turtle, though. He can easily hold his own. His mind just has to be in the right place. Raphael. Raph is considered the angriest turtle of the bunch, and that's not a surprise. Raph is a genuinely good turtle. It's just he has a lot of passion that comes off as anger. He wants to do good, but this want to fight for good often comes out in a violent way. Of course, he learns time and time again, his anger isn't his problem, it's the way he uses it. This is highlighted further with his connection with Michelangelo. Oftentimes, Mikey will annoy Raph with his childish antics, and Raph responds by threatening him with some kind of violent act. Of course, Raph doesn't always act on this. If anything, Raph loves Mikey the most. He would protect Leo and Donnie with his life, but he would find something even more inside him to protect Mikey. Splinter. He was once a human named Hamatsu Yoshi that was a master in ninjutsu and passed his knowledge onto the turtles. He's very wise and teaches his family everything he's learned as his time as a ninja, including combat training, life lessons, and offering general good pieces of advice. At first, Splinter is afraid to fight for his sons, but Splinter learns that if he is to stand by the advice he gives to his turtles, he should lead by example and fight evil too. April O'Neil one of the crew's reliable human allies. April in the series is a teenage girl that gets roped into the whole ordeal because her dad, Kirby, was kidnapped by the Krang. April is very smart, and will help the turtles any way she can, even if it has to do more than just rescuing her father. It's indicated she has some kind of telepathic power, part of the reason the Krang try and capture her. Leatherhead, a giant mutated crocodile that was experimented on by the Krang. Leatherhead is a good-hearted reptile, but unfortunately, his hatred for the Krang flips a switch in his brain that'll turn him unreasonably angry and destroy everything in sight. This uncontrollable behavior sometimes makes Leatherhead push himself away from the turtles, as he doesn't want to hurt them. Monkey Brains A scientist named Dr. Tyler Rockwell that experimented with telepathy, but unfortunately, the Krang would become interested in his works, ultimately leading him to becoming a mutated monkey. Well, that's actually not true. His colleague, Dr. Victor Falco, was running experiments on him, which turned him into the mutated monkey, and used that story to cover up his immoral work. Rockwell is released at the end of his debut episode, leaving him to roam the streets as an unstable primate. Pete the Pigeon, a rather uninspiring looking half pigeon, half man. The only other thing uninspiring about him is his intelligence. I will go more into detail about the three previously mentioned characters later down the line. They become more important, but since they appear in the first season and have some plot significance, I feel I had to mention them. Now onto the villains. The Shredder, the most evil one of them all. The Shredder is the Foot Clan's leader and will devise any plan to eliminate Splinter and the Turtles. The Shredder's real name is Oroku Saki and was a friend of Hamato Yoshi's, but jealousy and mistrust broke them apart, leading to their ongoing rivalry. Chris Bradford, one of the main disciples of the Foot Clan, Bradford has a stunning build and along with his knowledge of martial arts, he can easily overpower any enemy. Saver Montez Yet another one of Shredder's main henchmen. Montez, like Bradford, has great experience in all kinds of combat, weapons, and hand-to-hand. -hand. In episode 9 of the first season, both these characters clash with the turtles, only for them to be covered in mutagen after they actually spill some of the solution onto themselves. 
Bradford turns into a huge dog, with one of his arms a lot stronger than the other, and Zev returns into a fish, and must use a breathing device to aspirate, and mechanical legs to walk on land. These two are now known as Dog Pound and Fish Face. Karai The Foot Clan's second in command, Karai is the adopted daughter of Shredder. Karai never questioned the actions of her father until she encountered the turtles. It is then she starts to reconsider if she might be on the wrong side. Baxter Stockman Stockman is an evil scientist that works on and off for the Shredder and will bend to his every need. He's rather timid and submissive, but his inventions prove to be challenging to the turtles. Okay, that's enough character analysis. Let's actually get on to talking about Season 1. Season 1 focuses a lot on establishing this fictional version of New York, showcasing the power and systems of the Krang and the Foot Clan, and the ways the turtles learn to fight evil. Throughout the season, watchers will learn that Karai is actually the biological daughter of Splinter, although this is kept a secret from the turtles and Karai herself for a while. April trains with Master Splinter as he senses her psychic powers and wants her to hone in on them so she can use them to become a great female ninja. And the Krang are actually after April because she holds secret psychic powers that can help them take over the world. If that's not enough, there's a Krang hierarchy, and in the final episode, the Turtles prevent Krang Prime from using April's power and get rid of their hold on New York. Oh boy, was that enough of an exposition dump for you? 2012 has a pretty good first season. Sure, it moves slow sometimes, but it's rewarding to see the Turtles develop and become the respectful warriors they're known as. Karai's indecision about whether she should continue to be evil or turn to the other side, the backstory of Hamato Yoshi and Oroko Saki is enriching and adds a lot to the substance in terms of the relationship between the Turtles, Splitter, Shredder, and Karai, and the Krang situation not only gives us some cool action scenes, but also makes April a more interesting character. My sons, I know you are still joyously reveling in the defeat of our enemies, but a great question remains. What if Cupcakes could talk? Are our enemies truly defeated? The Shredder is a crafty and patient foe who bides his time. In Season 2, a bunch of mutagens get scattered throughout all of New York because of a clash with the Krang. To make matters worse, the Krang mutate all of the citizens of New York into Krang abominations and enslave them in Dimension X. The Turtles must create retro mutagen to revert the mutation and save New York from Krang's invasion. This season includes a lot of people and animals fusing with the mutagen, so that's some pretty cool fight scenes, and the new creatures introduced are pretty cool. Speaking of the new mutations, let's discuss them and the new characters. Kirby. In an attempt to protect April from being mutated, Kirby shields his daughter from a vial of mutagen as it lands on him and his body absorbs it. Because of this, he becomes this horrifying bat, and for a couple of episodes, April breaks off from the turtles and does things her own way. Razar. Dogpound falls into a pool of mutagen and gets further mutated into a bony werewolf with sharp claws, deadly teeth, and pointy bones. Bradford was cool enough, but now he's probably one of the coolest villains to come out of this franchise. I mean, just look at that design. And because he's further mutated, he's also a lot more bloodthirsty. Tiger Claw A trained assassin and one of the best warriors in the world, Tiger Claw is an incredible foe against our heroes. His fighting skill is unmatchable, and the turtles often struggle to foil his plans. Karai in her search for vengeance, Cry is captured and falls into mutagen, turning her into a serpent. Well, sorta. She can switch between the forms, but that doesn't change her snappy nature and distance with the turtles. Slash. Spike was the pet turtle of Raphael and kept him as a comfort companion. Unfortunately, Spike was covered in some mutagen left in Don's lab, and it turned him into a muscular turtle with the same intelligence as the ninja turtles. Unfortunately, he doesn't have the same heart. He goes against the rest of the turtles and doesn't like the way they fight. Spike renames himself to Slash and goes off to fight on his own at the end of the episode where he becomes mutated. Baxter Stockman Stockman becomes a mutant fly just like he did in the 80s cartoon. 
He was mad enough when he was a human, but now as a mutant, he's a lot more unstable and vengeful. Casey Jones. No, he's not a mutation, just some zealous boy that, at first, fights to protect April, but continues to put his life on the line to fight for good once he becomes cool with the turtles. This is really the only adaptation where Casey is a teenager. Krang Subprime. Remember the huge Krang leader from the end of Season 1? Well, she has a second in command named Krang Subprime that does a lot of the fighting for her, and bidding as well. Krang Subprime was actually spying on the squad by disguising himself as April's friend Irma. And oh boy, is this guy an oddball. He's got some impressive fighting skill, and is rough around the edges. I usually don't mention voice actors, but choosing Gilbert Gottfried to voice this character was absolutely perfect. His energy just fits this character so well. Much of Krang's mutagen supply was spent in the invasion of the city known as New York City. What is it with the Krang's invasion of the city known as New York City? What is that? We've been here for thousands of years. You can't even speak proper English! Krang does not understand. They did really well with these new characters. Tiger Claw is just so badass. From the design, to his history, to his fighting ability. He's an interesting character that always has something to offer whenever he's on screen. Karai's mutation makes sense with her character. While she can be reasonable and work with others, she's feisty and might go her own way if she gets too irritated. But this shouldn't undermine the fact that she's on the good side. This also correlates to the way she responds to the truth of her parents. It's not easy for her to part from the person who raised her, regardless that he lied to her for her whole life. She doesn't necessarily want to hurt anybody or do something malicious to the innocent, but dealing with the truth isn't easy. Casey's that same kid from Jersey like from the other adaptations, but since he's a teen, he's more cocky and arrogant. Regardless though, his fighting spirit is amazing, and you can't blame him for fighting for what's right. The variety of episodes, the arcs, character development, new characters, and overall depth of the stories make Season 2 really great. It's always developing, something's always happening to keep the viewers engaged and immerse them with the story of the TMNT. Speaking of which, at the end of the season, the Krang invade New York for a second time and start to mutate its population. The heroes try their best to fight off the Foot Clan and Krang, but are unsuccessful. Splinter is unconscious and lost in the depths of the sewers, and with the tides heavily turned against them, the Turtles have to flee the situation. Master Splinter is... gone. We lost. With New York overtaken, the Turtles must retreat if they want any chance at going back and defeating their opponents. The team makes their way to a farmhouse April's family owns in Massachusetts as a refuge. They will need to gather up all their strength and make a plan if they are to be successful. Unfortunately, the one that always makes the plans is severely wounded and needs some time to heal. So the first eight episodes take place in this remote environment, and then the Turtles get back to business in episode 9, where they return to New York to take back their home and fight evil once more. Before I go into the praise and critiques I have about this season, let me introduce the new characters. Anton Zek a hip flamboyant guy that uses lasers and stealth technology to fight his foes. He dances while in combat and makes high-pitched noises. He's sort of a parody of Michael Jackson. Ivan Steranko, a strong Russian tank that's been war-hardened. Talk about pure muscle, it takes a lot more than strength to take this guy down. Both these characters get captured by the Shredder and are covered in mutagen, turning them into Bebop and Rocksteady. Technically both these characters are in Season 2, but I'm mentioning them here because from here on out they play a bigger role now that they've become the animalistic duo. This season also introduces the Muta Animals, a group of mutants, Slash, Leatherhead, Monkey Brains, and Pigeon Pete, at first, that fight the Krang. Slash is the leader of the group and lays down the law with his huge mace, Monkey Brains has unmatched intellect and telepathy, Leatherhead has immense strength, and Pigeon Pete, well, he's got everybody's back. While they are a lot like the Turtles themselves, they of course have different ways of acting as a team. 
and this is certainly expressed in episodes like the Battle for New York. While I do like this season because of the invasion arcs, the plots involving the mind control worms, and Karai's development as a mutant, the first seven episodes really aren't that great in my opinion. Episode 3 is a fairly decent episode. I'm a sucker for episodes that give the viewers some backstory. It's also the episode that fully establishes April's psychic powers, adding some interesting lore and depth to a main character. The other six, on the other hand, are boring filler that really don't add much to the story. I don't have anything against filler episodes, as long as they're not boring and possibly attempt to give some backstory to anything, but these are just nothingness with stale humor. I get into this issue a bit later, but I feel I should mention it here since it is a review. Regardless, the rest of the season is decent. Some of the filler episodes aren't as good as the first two seasons fillers, but they're watchable, and as I mentioned before, the arcs are very enjoyable. Anyways, Season 3 ends with the turtles running into the Triceratons, a species of human-like Triceratops that live in space. They want to rid the Earth of Krang, but in order to do so, they will destroy the planet. Not only do our heroes have to fight off these dinosaurs, but they have to hold back the Krang too. Splinter does make an alliance with the Foot Clan to fight off the other evils, but things don't go as planned, and the Earth is destroyed. Not all hope is gone though. The turtles, April and Casey make it out alive thanks to a high-tech spaceship that saved them. A whole new journey will unfold in the next season. You are surrounded! Hand over the pieces of the black hole device to me, or we will blow you out of the cosmos! So, Earth is completely destroyed, but the present doesn't have to be that way. Season 4 introduces the Fugitoid, a once-human android that understands the fate of the turtles and decides to pitch in to save their world and his. If the team is to stop the invasion, they have to go back 6 months in time and collect all parts of the black hole generator before the Triceratons can. The team must travel all around the galaxy to find these parts, and the journey isn't without its shenanigans and challenges. The team eventually gets all the parts and prevents the destruction of Earth, but as long as the Krang and the Foot Clan are active, the Turtles can never stop fighting. Let's take a step back and introduce the new characters before going any further. Lord Dreg, an insect ruler that tries to foil the Turtles' plans to get the Black Hole Generator, is one of the main antagonists of the space episodes and can prove to be difficult to handle thanks to its strength and drones we can easily control. Commander G. Thraka aka Sal Commander, an anthropomorphic salamander fighting for his world. Sal Commander uses his military training and plays by the rules. He doesn't always agree with the turtles, but at the end of the day, they can defeat evil. Sal Commander has a trusty sidekick named Lieutenant Igithba, aka Mona Lisa, and she's very much like him. Strict, stern, but has compassion. She's also notable because she develops a romantic relationship with Raphael. Shinigami, a magical witch with many tricks. Shinigami is a mysterious one with her many special abilities. She can also hypnotize her enemies. The Utrom High Council. So the Krang is composed of these creatures known as Utroms. That's what the pink aliens in the stomach of the robots are called. Well, it turns out not all of them are bad. Some actually want to protect the universe from all kinds of evil intruders. There are four members, Bishop, Rook, Pawn, and Queen, although Bishop has the biggest role out of the four. Bishop is actually a Krang clone, but he does have a much higher intelligence and fighting skill than the rest of the Krang androids, and even had a falling out with Krang Subprime. Bishop does appear in the third season first, but I also wanted to mention the Utrum High Council. However, they don't appear until season four, so that's why I'm bringing up Bishop now. Some drastic stuff happens during the season past the Space Invaders take over. Splinter is stuck in a pit, where the Rat King is trying to invade a spirit and possess his mind. Meanwhile, the Shredder has turned into this horrible mutation that's only getting worse as he demands Stockman continue feeding him mutagen. Soon, Splinter does overcome the Rat King's hypnosis, and the Shredder becomes the Super Shredder, and in this form, he kills Splinter. Our heroes aren't ones for revenge, but in an event like this, they must avenge their master. And after much determination, blood, fight, and trial and error, the Shredder is no more gone forever. I've gotta say, this is probably some of the boldest stuff the franchise has done. 
Killing off Shredder and Splinter must have taken some bravado, considering how well written they are in this show. Of course, the cartoon has the audience rooting for Splinter, so they don't want to see him die. And while Shredder is evil, having him die would be ridding the audience of a menacing, suitable opponent for the TMNT. Apart from that, Season 4 feels a bit hit or miss. It's pretty good for the most part, but I always think the episodes that take place in space could have been executed better. The arcs back on Earth when it's eventually saved feel a lot stronger and well written than the stories that take place outside of our green planet. I mean, the whole Super Shredder thing is just so cool, and it knows how to build tension and conflict in an eye-catching way. The space episodes feel kind of loosely tied together by the fact that Teen needs to collect all the black hole parts, and not much else. There are right episodes, but the second half of the season really outshines the first half. Our journey together has not been an easy one, but it could not have happened without fate, courage, and great purpose. Season 5 of TMNT 2012 is known as Tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and rather than the entirety taking place in New York, it sees the turtles going through time and dimensions. Each tale usually spans three episodes, and there are six stories. This includes, but not limited to, the remaining members of the Foot Clan trying to revive the Shredder with the help of a demon known as Kavaxis, a run-in with Usagi Yojimbo, a samurai rabbit that actually has an actual comic line, it was owned by Mirage Comics at one point. A timekeeper known as Renee recruits the turtles to stop an ancient demon from using time travel to recruit the most evil monsters throughout history, and one more run-in with the 1987 turtles. This season is probably the weakest set of the series. It's not bad, but considering it doesn't really have a story that goes on for the whole season, it undermines the reason that a lot of people watch this cartoon. It's hit or miss too. The Usagi story, 80s run-in, and Gavax's arcs are good, they flow well, fit with the series' tone, and are entertaining. The other half, not so much. But they're just alright, and not much to really say about them if I'm being honest. With that, I don't really know what else to say about Season 5, a rather short section for a rather uneventful season. I'd probably have more to say about it if it would actually contribute to the story. Team in 2012 is pretty good when it's trying to tell a story and actually wants to show the depth of the characters, their bonds, and connections to their clans slash kin. So what about when it's trying to be silly or not serious? Well before I dive into that, I have to address one of my biases real quick. I'll be the first to admit, I'm not really into cartoons that are more nonsensical and don't really have a plot or do anything to tell something of value. With that being said, I don't have issues with cartoons that just want to be a fun time and not do so much in terms of story development. They're just not my cup of tea. Not every kid appropriate cartoon, or any cartoon for that matter, has to do that. However, when there's a cartoon that wants to mix the fun with serious topics, it has to be careful, otherwise it can confuse audiences in the way it wants to portray itself. Sometimes TMNT 2012 does this, but there's an episode that has an important plot piece, but is mostly nonsensical, or just boring pieces of filler. For example, Season 2 Episode 5, Mikey Gets Shell Acne. The title says it all. Mikey gets shell acne thanks to some mutagen that he used on himself, and has to get rid of it before he explodes into pus. Meanwhile, Karai orders Dog Pound and Fish Face to go find Baxter Stockman for some unfinished business. So on one hand, while enjoying the way Shredder's previous disciples interact with Karai's leadership, and the way they deal with Stockman, I have to deal with the PG comedy of Mikey trying to avoid death, and as an adult, I really don't find it that funny. Most of these episodes do generally have a sense that they're not going to be serious and will be a more fun filler episode, but I just can't skip some of them because they may have important plot pieces in them. Take that previous example, Dogpound becomes Browsar in that episode. If I were to skip it, I would be left wondering what happened to Bradford in a future episode that has Razar. 
I know they can make good episodes where they balance serious and silly. The episodes where they have the 2012 Turtles with the 80s Turtles execute the balance adequately, as I mentioned before. So, it's not like it's impossible. Secondly, this art style. I mean, it looks alright for the most part, but I can't help but think most of the humans are kind of downright disgusting. April and Casey look fine, but why does everybody else look so yucky? There is a TMNT movie that released 5 years before this that looked good in terms of the design, so what happened? Am I the only one who thinks this cartoon could have looked a lot better? Okay, one more thing. Season 5. Season 5 isn't a bad season by any means, but it feels off the rails for this series. This cartoon is known for providing audiences with interesting and deep stories and arcs that last and develop throughout a season. So for an entire season to have a couple different stories that don't really connect, it creates a huge contrast. I understand they wanted to do something different, and quite honestly, if they tied all these episodes under a guise of an evil character sending the turtles into different dimensions and times, it would have felt a lot more connected in the tone with 2012's way of storytelling. Not to mention, the way everything seasons 1 and 4 stringed everything together with their stories was one of 2012's strongest suits, so if we were to abandon this in return for isolated stories, it undermines the reason why so many fans like this cartoon, and the primary reason a lot of fans hold this cartoon as their favorite adaptation of the franchise. It is not every day you make the world safe from an alien invasion. You got that right. Everybody who saved the world? Mikey! <sighs> we saved the world! Yeah! TMNT 2012 is a really good cartoon when it takes viewers on a journey and wants to entertain the audience with actual stories. Its art style and filler episodes may not be that great, but its storytelling is phenomenal, the characters are well developed and interesting, and everything feels connected and flows so well. Season 5 may not be that great because it abandons the formula of the previous seasons, but most of the stories it has are not bad and worth a watch anyway if one is already a fan of the franchise. It has a good mix of inspiration taken from other adaptations and new material created just for the show. And until next time, Booyakasha! Happy 10th anniversary to this amazing show.